TG Geeks, episode 245, October 28th, 2019. Spooktacular tease just for you. Hello and welcome to another webcast from TGGeeks.com, where Ben and Keith, the two gay geeks, talk about all aspects of geekdom and nerdery, sci-fi, comics, film, horror, genre, you name it, we talk about it. I'm coming to you, uh, who am I? I'm Keith Lane and we're coming to you from TG Squared Studios in lovely Phoenix, Arizona. I had a, a different track going on in my head. I uh, could tell that. <laughs> something I was going to say. Uh -huh. that we're, Our Halloween episode <laughs> that we have put together for you here. It's uh, uh -huh. not spooky or very Halloween-y other than the... Uh, the interview. The interview. But... Uh, Anyway, it's getting cool in Phoenix, and it's Halloween time. And I'm Ben Raggington, and what he's just said. <laughs> there we are. Let's get on with it. Prepare for hyperdrive. Meanwhile, in the Hall of Episodes, the two gay geeks are discussing this. Well, in this episode, we are going to talk to Ben Scrivens. He is the owner, janitor, <laughs> all around everything for FrightRags.com. You may have seen some of our uh, press releases for them of different t-shirts and merchandise that they have. He has really some really neat stuff and he talks about how he got that started how it all began and and what he's doing now he has licensed merchandise for all kinds of things it's truly an amazing endeavor that he has going on there so we're going to talk to him and uh, see what he's all about and what fright rags is all about of course we have a birthday shout outs our featured podcast of the week and we have some feedback this week, as well as our regular shout-outs. In the second segment, we're going to talk about a movie that we just watched, which is <laughs> a actually an old film, but... Uh, uh, it's a couple of years old. Yeah, several years old, and uh, we just finally watched it. We finally picked it up and watched it and uh, what we thought about it. And then Ben will give our weekly recap and then a few shout-outs, and we'll move on. So that's... That is the agenda for this episode. So we're going to get right to talking to Ben. And this time we have a bit of a treat for you. We have the owner, founder, uh, jack of all trades for Fright Rags. You may have seen some of the oh, we've uh, done press, a releases press releases that we've for done that. Yes, for Fright Rags recently. And uh, welcome to the show, Ben Scrivens. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Sure. Yeah, I, it was interesting. I was, uh, as I said uh, in my email to you, that I'd, I'd seen where. You were going to do interviews, and I, I just thought, we need to interview this guy. He has some, uh, the neatest stuff. So tell us, tell us who Ben Scrivens is and how you got into this whole thing that you're doing with Fright Rags. Well, it's a good question. So I've been a horror fan pretty much all my life. I, um, I saw Halloween when I was uh, at the tender age of four years old. Oh, um, <laughs> man. Did that traumatize yeah. you or not? Uh, actually, well, maybe some people say it did, but I don't think it didn't. But um, <laughs> Well, it certainly I did was, me. I mean, I couldn't sleep. <laughs> you you know, like, were older. <laughs> I, well, I was a little older. I couldn't <laughs> sleep for three nights. I was so freaked out. I mean, I can watch it now and love it. I can even laugh at it. But when I first saw it, I was freaked out horribly. Well, I think what happened was so it was it was the night before Halloween. It was 1981, and I, I had um, we had we went over to a friend's house for a party, and I, I was just bored and I wanted to leave. And my parents were like, "No, just go watch TV or something. Just basically get out of our hair." 
And yeah. uh, I just sat down and turned on the TV. And, and actually, I mean, obviously, I didn't know it at the time because I was four, but it was a network premiere of Halloween on, on broadcast television. And um, I just sat and watched it. And, it, I, you know, it's weird. I think I was too young to get scared. I think it was almost it just I just couldn't believe what I was watching because I'd never seen anything like that before. Um, in, in, in the next couple of years when I'd see it again, I would get pretty scared of it. You know, cause, and then I'd watch part two and I was like, wow, this is scary. And, but I wanted to see more. I think it was, it just, if, I mean, I'll never forget it. It was so indelible. It just left such an indelible mark on my, my brain that it was the movie that still is my favorite of all time. Horror, non-horror, doesn't matter. It's my favorite movie of all time. I mean, well, it's Halloween, always. Cool. It, well, it certainly um, gave birth to all the tropes that we have today. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Oh, a ton of them. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, growing up as a horror fan, um, I would rent these movies and and i was the youngest of four so i got i definitely had a little more leeway than my brothers and my sister did with certain Mm -hmm. things but i was definitely the first one into horror and i would get into the fangoria magazines and i would i would try to you know do the effects on myself to make it look like i cut my arm and i would show my mom like hey look look (laughs) and and i think they were a little worried they they admitted they admitted later on that they were a little worried about me but i also (laughs) noticed that i yeah but uh, that I really liked the uh, the effects part of it and the magic trick a part of it, and I liked being scared. And it's funny because by the time I was about nine, they had had they had to sign the back of my rental card um, to allow me to rent R-rated movies by myself. Wow! Mm. Um, because I would ride my bike up to the rental store, and the people would keep calling my parents, like, "Are you are you okay to let them watch this?" And she's like, "My mom or my dad, like, yeah, they, she he can. Don't worry about it." So they finally signed the back of my card. And, um, yeah, and my parents weren't into it either, like, at all. Like, my mom sat down with me at 10 years old when my friend and I watched uh, Hellraiser. Oh. And uh, we were 10 or 11, and she's like, why do you like this crap? And <laughs> that movie, you know, that – I would never – I mean, I have a 10-year-old son. I wouldn't let him watch that movie right now. I'd be like, no way. So <laughs> it's uh, – I, I have to give my parents credit for allowing me to do it and just kind of keeping me – keeping it – sort of all right just keeping an eye on it but not intervening too much Mm -hmm. um so i think it turned out okay i guess well (laughs) you uh, you parlayed it into a a business business, but i I, but i want to ask this because we don't get to talk to a lot of horror people uh especially someone in your position who you know you've taken a love for horror and you've now turned it into this 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 business that you've got going but uh from you, from just a, a viewer standpoint or as a fan what is it about horror going to see a horror film what is it that just really pushes all your buttons well it's you know it, and I know I'm not obviously not the first or the last person to say this but you I liken it to a, a roller coaster mm, you know yep. I mean, you get you get into a, 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 a car and you get strapped in and you're doing all these things that any normal person can't do, but you're, you're safe. Right. Mm-hmm. And in fact, horror movies are even safer because you're not even moving. I mean, people have died on roller coasters. I don't think many people have died watching horror movies unless they had some preexisting <laughs> condition. So the exorcist. You know, <laughs> yeah. Right. So I think it's, it's the idea. It's, it's just a lot of things. It's exercising your inner sort of demons and fears. I think, you know, seeing these things you know obviously most of them are violent but just scary things depicted on screen i think is a catharsis to a lot of yeah. fears and anxieties people have that's why you see horror uh have an uptick in the box office when there's uh political turmoil or things like that going on in the in the uh, country you know i mean i just heard a statistic that haunted houses you know in october had their peak the best season ever in in october of 2001 right after september 11th hmm. wow and i i you know i think there's a lot of correlation there and you know people are like oh you know movies and tv and video games are gonna cause people to kill other people and i'm like no i think it's actually the other way around i think if you can exercise these things not to say that everyone wants to see other people die but i think when you watch these movies you're you're just you're living vicariously you're experiencing these emotions you're getting scared you're getting excited you're you're able to sort of express yourself in ways that I don't think happen watching just anything. Well, it maybe also gives you a sense of empowerment because by virtue mm-hmm. of having survived or endured that particular horror experience, maybe it helps the the person take better control of their own lives and not feel That's like they're point. out of control. You know, like watching you know the towers fall or something like that. I mean, maybe, maybe he says, you know, I survived this. I am a survivor. 
Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I think being able to watch that uh, beginning, middle, and end and having somebody survive these extreme horrors and overcome them, not just survive, but overcome them, battle them, fight them, kill them, um, I think does give the viewer a sense of empowerment and maybe even just helps them you know, in, in their daily lives. I absolutely think that's true. Yeah. Hadn't well, even considered that. Yeah, we were were not really uh, big horror fans originally. No, I love it. <laughs> uh, but uh, our friend Miguel Rodriguez of Horrible Imaginings Film Festival, who we talked to many years ago, kind of told us what horror was and how he approached curating that film festival. And he basically broke it down to anything that can is somewhat unexpected and unexpected not necessarily a jump scare but some twist or turn that's unexpected and it doesn't have to always be blood and gore and guts and mm-hmm. since that time we we have embraced horror and really found some incredible uh, horror flicks through independent films you know big studios etc so mm-hmm. it is uh it is a, a misunderstood genre it, it very much is and i i've actually like i said i've actually gone to really appreciate it i'm i find myself surfing the shutter streaming service quite a lot these days because there's a lot of interesting things there but we're not here to talk about that no, because we're, we're you here to, we're here to talk about <laughs> your business you and, have managed to start something absolutely and hey. how how did that love for horror kind of manifest itself into what you're doing now um well i've always been a creative person i've always liked to draw and i've always liked things you know i i've I've just always had that sort of inclination to want to create something and it's weird because as a kid and even as a teenager and a young adult like i wanted to write books or i wanted to make movies and i wanted to make comic books i wanted to do all these things i actually never did any of them i mean i would start but i never completed anything So it was always the idea of it and planning and stuff. So as I got into my uh, early sort of mid-20s, I I was done with college. I had gotten a job here. I was in Rochester. I'm a graphic designer, sort of. That's where I got my my degree in. And I I landed a job at a very, very small company. I was the third person on board uh, that designed laptop bags. So I did everything from the website to the print, collateral, all these things. And it was great, and it was fun to be in a small a small business. But you know, at the time, uh, my girlfriend or my fiance and I at the time were living together in an apartment. So we didn't have kids, we didn't have a house to kind of maintain. Like we had a lot of free time, you know. And I would spend that just kind of thinking of things that I could do. And in the meantime, I was on all of these horror message boards and things. This is before like Facebook and even MySpace. And I would be on these message boards of people that were creating stuff like my friend Justin makes masks. And they were so amazing because I always wanted a really good Michael Myers mask for Halloween. I wanted a nice Freddy glove or a Jason mask. And I saw people doing these creative things and I just got this urge to make something. But there was no way I was going to start sculpting masks in my apartment. I didn't <laughs> have any experience in that. Um, but I always liked kind of off the wall t-shirts even in high school i always kind of wore like kind of funky shirts like with weird sayings on them and stuff um so i gravitated toward that and i realized i never really had a shirt like with my favorite movie on and i think i'd gotten a promotional shirt from halloween from like 98 or something but like there was never just a horror shirt that i would wear and i thought i should make my own and and around the time this is 2003 there was the, uh, what would Jesus do craze? You'd mm-hmm. see it everywhere. And I thought, well, what would Jason do? And <laughs> what, it, what would, and if you just took the J out and put a hockey mask, it would sell, it would tell the story like WW hockey mask B. And right. so I came up with that concept and I thought it was kind of funny. And then I thought, well, what if that hockey mask was just really big on a shirt? That would look cool. Cause it doesn't have to say Friday the 13th on it. And then what if I made like a, really generic looking Michael Myers mask and just put like trick or treat under it. So it didn't have to say Halloween. So I just started, come up with these ideas and i talked to my buddy justin who ran the uh, night owl message board which was his own company mass making company and he loved them and he's like you know what? i should put these up on my message board and people were were really the complimentary of them and they really liked them and they said you know uh we buy these as t-shirts and everything so it was literally over the course of like three days labor day weekend 2003 i just came up with a name and i figured out how to make it, you know, I kind of knew already how to make a website because of being in college and stuff. And I just kind of put it together and I spent, I'll never forget. I put 600 bucks down on t-shirts, which 
to me at the time was like that was a lot outrageous. of money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was no way I knew how I was going to pay any of that back. I didn't think I'd be able to make profit or I didn't know anything. I literally knew nothing about running, starting or doing anything in business. I just knew how to maybe link up a PayPal buy button to a HTML website. And that was it. Like that's, that's how I started. And then wow. just from there, I just kept going and going and it was, it became this obsession for me. And and now you, I'm pretty. You appear to be a fairly successful business and have lots of wonderful stuff. Well, yeah, we keep seeing and, press releases yeah. about all these new items that you're going to be releasing that tie into all these other properties. But, but that that kind of begs the question: How have you approached the studios uh, for licensing rights? Yeah. So yeah, for the for the first several years, you know, I didn't obviously. I just did it under the radar, and 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 honestly, I got caught a few times i got cease and desist i had to pay money and they, oh, it wasn't fun <laughs> but i always wanted to be licensed but i didn't have the money i didn't even know what that was like so after about oh i don't i mean i did get a couple licenses early on in the day very very like uh come was like a napkin contract type of deal oh, with Subway cam two and three and there's right. a couple other ones that i worked on but um as i got bigger and as we as the company grew and i took on some employees and I started realizing, you know, we got to kind of transition here and I would start contacting smaller studios, like say Troma to do Toxic Avenger or right. uh, just other things that I could kind of build off of. And as I got more of those under my belt, I could go to the bigger studios and get uh, bigger titles. And so, I mean, now everything is licensed. Everything we do is officially licensed. We work with pretty much every major studio and we have for a number of years. So uh, it just it just took a while to... And, and, <laughs> tons of learning i mean tons of screwing up and figuring stuff out or getting a contract going well i've never seen this before what does this mean what does this word mean right. you know looking exactly it up, but, uh, it's a lot of a lot of effort but you know it's it's fun and it's uh it's a lot of work and it's a lot of stress but it's a lot of you know this is it's where I get to make horror shirts for a living. This is pretty incredible. Yeah. So I, the one that uh, really kind of tripped my trigger was the uh, Big Trouble in Little China Ooh. that you did here, what, oh, three or four months ago. Love that, was, that one. Just, some of the merchandise was incredible on that. And Oh, thank you. Yeah. So you have some really big stuff going on for Halloween. Well, yeah, now, now so. that we're coming into Halloween, yeah. this is so like uh, wanna... the holy days for uh, horror fans. Right. Can you tell us what, what you got going? And so you'll be inundated here a couple of days before Halloween and have more orders than you can know what to do with. Excellent. Yeah, so we've got we've, we've basically had to make two, re two releases every week because of all the stuff we wanted to put out this month. So... Um, we've already done a 10th anniversary collection for the movie Trick or Treat um, with a little Sam character. He's one of my favorites. And we've done, uh, we actually just put out some coffee, uh, officially licensed Bella Lugosi coffee Ooh, um, wow. that we worked with his granddaughter on and stuff, which was fun. Really? And uh, he, Oh, yeah, yeah. It was all, we worked with his granddaughter um, and his son actually is a, uh, um, I've met him a few times. He's a spitting image of his dad. Oh, and, freaky. Uh, yes, yeah, so we worked with a company called Dead Sled Coffee and Lynn, um, Bella's granddaughter, to produce this coffee. Because we do shirts with her with, with, Dra with Bella's likeness for Dracula and White Zombie and things. So, um, And then we've, this week we've got uh, – we've had the Halloween licenses for many of the titles for many years now. So it's always a challenge and – and, and fun challenge to figure out what we're going to do every year because we don't want to do the same things. Last year we had a huge Halloween release because of the 40th anniversary of the original. So this year we're reprinting a lot of our uh, most wanted designs and then brand new. We've got a, a, a vintage style trading card set for the original movie. Oh, um, wow. We, we have them coming in wax packs just like the old cards used to do with the chip back. Um, we've had sketch cards thrown in there. We've got PJ Souls autographs thrown in there. So there's randomly inserted. So you might get an autograph or a sketch card or something. So we've been doing some trading cards the last couple of years. And I'm so proud and happy to finally get this Halloween one out. It's going to be great. Um, we've got uh, official collections for The Crow um, coming up. We've got Universal Monsters coming up. We're just starting that one. There's been some... A couple speed bumps that we ran into, so we've got a smaller collection coming out this month, but more stuff to do out next year. Um, and yeah, and, and then at the end of the month, we've got um, another 
mini Halloween release on the 29th. And that is going to be a, uh, we're reissuing the nylon uh, Halloween jacket we put out in May, which sold like crazy. We've I'll got bet. a limited number made. And then we've got a, a new um, Halloween dad style hat that's coming out, which is really cool. So that would be right before and Halloween. you heard it so right gonna... here on TG Geek. Yes. And you can do that tomorrow at FrightRags.com or Fright-Rags.com, right? Right. Mm-hmm. So, That's it. Cool. Oh, wow. Fantastic. Yeah. And all of the press releases that you get, I, I try to run them as soon as I get them. Uh, sometimes it's like the, the next day, but I really appreciate all of the work that you have put into those uh, graphics that you do. I assume you're doing a lot of the graphics for the the releases and or, or you have somebody that's doing those. No, actually, I have. Uh, we have a designer on staff, Joe, who handles all that. So oh, cool. it's weird. Like I don't get to do much of the graphic. That was going to be my next question. <laughs> I mean, you have got all this all this experience, you know. But now that you're like, you know, the president, CEO, yeah. God of Fright Rags. I mean, don't you're 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 he has so, you're, more things to do. <laughs> you're the man now. Well, it's funny. It's fun, it's funny because I have to get my hands dirty a little bit once in a while. Like, I mean, I I usually I'm I guess I'm more of the uh, creative slash art director because like if artists send us their designs and things that we're working with obviously i have to sign off on it or i'll make notes or whatever but so it's more of a directing type of thing but there's been some times where you know we did a, a collection for the fly earlier this year and you know we were trying to figure out what to do and, and we were limited in use of what we could do with likenesses and things and we had an image that we could use of jeff goldblum and he was kind of crouched down and looking to the side and mm-hmm. and i thought I was just messing around one day and I cut his head out of the picture and just made it black and white and blew it up on a, on a shirt. Cause I used to have a shirt that looked similar, but it had Gilligan from Gilligan's Island on it. <laughs> and I thought, God, this is so ridiculous. It could actually work because it's Jeff Goldblum. Like Jeff Goldblum is one of those, you know, pop culture icons. Now. Right. And you don't need to like the fly or know the fly to know that that's Jeff Goldblum. And that's just a big blown up image of his face. Right. And so, I thought, well, if we can get this approved by Fox, let's see if we can let's let's sell this with their fly collection. Why not? I mean, it, it was in the fly, or whatever. Oh my god, we sold out of it like twice in like a week. Wow. We kept having to reprint it. So it's kind of funny. It's nice to be able to kind of jump in once in a while and do some things. But I, I just I wish I had more time for that type of thing. I just don't. It's I've got way too many other things to do. But it's cool because I get to dip my toes into a lot of different areas of business and not just stick with one thing. So it keeps me busy. Yeah. So it sounds like based on what you just described with the, the fly property, you know, fry rags is doing quite well. It seems like, I mean, this it's, it's a successful business. Yes. Yes, it is. And I'm very proud. I mean, we've got, we're a team of seven people. Um, and I've been doing it as my full time, career if you will for 11 years now so after i started it it took me about five years to get it off the ground to where i could quit my full-time job and i did in 2008 and haven't looked back and yeah like i said we're seven people we're we're actually in the old uh city morgue in downtown rochester how appropriate (laughs) it's so (laughs) wow So yeah. that is that is so far out, uh, and I've seen some of the the, the things that you that you make uh, on your website. But uh, I, I and I recommend everybody. There is there's got to be something out there for everybody, and whether you're a fan of horror or not, you can find something there that you will appreciate. I mean, even if we weren't into horror, Keith and I weren't into horror. The fact that you've got you know something dealing with big trouble in little China will be enough to draw me out. But for anybody who is listening to this interview right now, how can they learn more about Fright Rags? Uh, obviously, there's a website that they can go to. Is there any other social media presence? Yes, uh, we're pretty much everywhere. You can go Instagram is at Fright Rags, all one word. Um, Twitter is the same, at Fright Rags, all one word. And we're at Facebook.com uh, backslash uh, Fright Rags. And then, yeah, that's all one word, too. And then, of course, the website is Fright-Rags.com. And um, yeah, you can reach out to us there. You can reach out to us on social media. I'm on Instagram quite a bit. So, um, yeah, there's definitely been plenty of places for people to find us and, and connect with us. That is really cool. Well, thank you so much for being on our show and telling us about Fright Rags. Yeah, and I, I need to we, go we there. Wanted and... to, we wanted to know more about Fright Rags. Well, and this I, is I want to do more than just talk to this guy. I, want to buy, I need to buy some things. <laughs> exactly. Well, I appreciate it, guys, and thanks for having me. Yep. This is online gadfly and well-regarded jerk Hannibal Taboo, and you're listening to the Two Gay Geeks. That 
was a really fascinating conversation. I knew it was going to be interesting, but that was interesting. It was it was really cool how he got started. <laughs> And all of the things that he's doing is like, oh my gosh! I don't think he really just, expected I was going to yeah. become the thing that it is now. Exactly. You know, but the fact that he could quit his day job, yeah, that's that, that kind of nice, says it. That's a nice thing. Yeah. What's it like? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> if we could make even more than twenty dollars, we would be happy. <laughs> Here's a few selected birthdays for October twenty eighth through November third, two thousand nineteen. October 28th, Joaquin Phoenix. What can you say? Joker now? Um, Joker. That, that's the big one that that's everybody's big talking one about. Everybody's talking about right now. Bill Gates, one of our tech overlords. Oh, yeah. And actually, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is doing some really good in the world. I mean, they, they've given millions of dollars to that foundation that is... Uh, Providing water to clean water to lots of folks and all, just a tremendous number of things. They, they do lots of stuff, really a lot of good work in the world. Also on October 28th, Jonas Salk, famed viro- virologist for the polio vaccine mm-hmm. that he discovered and implemented in 1955. He gave that vaccine away for free. If he had sold it and took any oh my God. anything, he would be a millionaire. But he decided that it was definitely worth, you know, giving away well, for free. What? Because, oh it my was God, polio. polio was a horrible, horrible, horrible disease. So, also Elsa Lanchester, Jessica Marble, Jessica Marbles, <laughs> and also she was the bride of Frankenstein. That's right. Yes, and she was quite a looker in her days. I mean, she really was. And if I remember correctly, oh, God, I can't think of the name. Oh, shoot. Um, I can't think of the one of the actors who played uh, the Hunchback of Notre Dame, uh, who played Quasimodo. Not Obviously, the first one was Lon Chaney Sr., but it's the second one. I can't remember his name right now. Peter Lorre? No, not Peter no. Lorre. No, but, they, I, but she was married to him for a time. Oh, anyway. Okay. Also, uh, Edith Head. Oh, E. E, yes, she started her career with Paramount in 1924. She was actually teaching language and and whatnot before she moved to fashion, Los Angeles, you know, clothes and design, took in, uh, some classes in uh, art and started doing fashion design. And she worked at Paramount for 43 years. As and a the Oscars designer. that she acquired, eight Academy Awards. She moved over to Universal to work with Hitchcock. So that's mm. why she she moved from uh, Paramount to Universal. And, of course, the character of E in The Incredibles is yes. modeled after Edith Head. Exactly. Also, October 28th, Matt Smith. Everybody's favorite wacky doctor. Yes, the wacky doctor. Fish fingers and custard. Oh, God. What? <laughs> yes, new mouth, new rules. Yep. Also, uh, Facebook friend Megan Enlow and Miguel Gonzalez. October 29th, Bob Ross, Mr. Happy Trees himself. Ah. If you, uh, please, just go watch one of his <laughs> episodes. It is a scream. He is so positive about everything. Well, we'll just put a few little I know. happy trees here. And, I know. You know, this little babbling brook. It's so it. silly, but it's him, amazing. He and does he, an entire painting. In minutes. In, it seems in like. one episode. I know. He, it's, it's just... Well, it's like watching Gilead do his, his artwork, artwork. I know that we. I mean, I mean in twenty minutes, it, he did a whole dragon. You know, and I keep, and I watch it and I keep thinking, you know, in terms of Bob Ross, because I have seen uh, his shows, and I keep thinking, now, what what am I doing wrong? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> also, on October 29th, Ralph Bakshi, a wild filmmaker, Wizards, and the Lord of the, the Rings. His take on Lord of the Rings, yeah. which is controversial, yeah. to say the least, and Richard Dreyfus. Close Encounters is among a, a whole. Oh, Mr. Holland's Opus. Stuff. Yes. Which I loved. And uh, classmate of mine, Dwayne Smither. October 30th, John Adams. Now, which one are we talking about? There's there's more than one. Are we the talking the composer? John oh, Adams. the. Oh, ah. The John One Adams. of the founding fathers, John yes, Adams. Exactly. President John Adams. 
I, I his biography was just oh, it's amazing. Uh, wow, it was a tome, but it was yes, incredible. but and I I think that one is probably the most interesting out of all of those founding father biographies because well, of all the documentation that they had, at, you know, the, the writer had at his fingertips. Yeah, he was actually. Uh, he was aware, John Adams was aware, that they were making history, right. and he made a copy of every single piece of correspondence that he sent or received. And uh, so it's, he's the most well-documented of mm-hmm. the Founding Fathers, as well as all of his other papers of thoughts and contemporaneous, you know, memos, etc. Yeah. So... And yeah. he's he's always been... I mean, I, I, I have great respect for all of them, but... He's uh, a personal favorite of mine. Yep. Also on October 30th, Henry Winkler. Uh, besides comedy, he's a, a good dramatic actor. Oh, well very, as, very good. You know, director and producer yeah. and etc. Grace Slick. Oh, of Jefferson Airplane. We pet this kitty so she don't growl. Is that the words to that song? No. No. You sure? Maybe. <laughs> I couldn't find somebody who who was uh, who was it Wolfman Jack that did uh, Werewolf London? Uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. It, uh, 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 oh shoot, War- uh, Warren Zevon. I, I think yeah. it might have been Warren yeah. Zevon. Yeah. yeah, we used to we used to sing about one of our cats. That, uh, she is a cat. She is the monster cat. cat. The monster cat. Right. She does the cat that's, box scratch. That's oh Jesus. That's <laughs> Bobby Boris Pickett. Anyway, and what has that got to do with anything? I don't know. It's just to fill time. <laughs> October thirtieth. Also, Andre Chenier, who was a poet during the French Revolution, he was guillotined three days before the end of the Reign of Terror. Mm. It uh, was the subject of an opera by Umberto Giordano. Also, Mario Ortiz, a Facebook friend of ours, and Pablo Absento, a filmmaker. October 31st, John Candy. I want some candy. <laughs> and Michael Landon. Peter Jackson. Oh, my. Johannes Vermeer, who was a legendary Dutch painter. And Stephen Ray, who uh, actually is an Irish actor, was in V as well as uh, a number of other things. Michael Collins, Apollo 11 pilot. Uh Uh-huh. David Ogden Stiers. Or Steers. Steers, or however you want to say it. It does actually, uh, it says Stiers. Oh, does it really? I didn't know that. In the Wikipedia entry. S-T-Y-E-R-S, Stiers. Oh. Anyway, so I've always called him David Ogden Steers. I'm sure. I think that's how everybody calls him, but I, I, something in the back of my mind is telling me that you're right, that it's actually Stiers, and that he actually just, you know, because everybody referred to him as Steers, he just let it go. Yeah. He actually did, uh, had a, quite a career of voiceover. Oh, my. After, uh, after MASH. After MASH. I mean, my God, that's practically all he did after that. Yeah. Lots, and amazing voice work. Oh, and and just a master of a thousand voices. I mean, I, I, is, is, I you know, I'm sure everybody really remembers him most as Cogsworth from Beauty and the Beast, but I loved him most in Lilo and Stitch. Yes. Like, yes. he's hilarious <laughs> as the evil scientist. Yes, he is. <laughs> now, speaking of uh, Lilo and Stitch, Ollie Johnston, who had nothing to do with uh, Lilo and Stitch. No, but, but he was a Disney animator. He was a Disney legend. <laughs> one originals. He was one of the nine old men, one of uh, Walt's nine old men. Uh, quite the animator himself. And also Laura Bassey, uh, or Bassey, or B- Bassey, or however you want to say it. She I have was no idea. Italian physicist in the uh, 18th century, late 18th century. And she was the first woman to be named to a university chair in a scientific field. And she um, was a proponent of Newtonian mechanics. Ooh. Also on October 31st, Jen Hines. Happy birthday, Jen, on Halloween. Yes. How about that? November 1st, Tim Cook, one of our our gay tech overlord. Mm Mm-hmm. And Peter Ostrom. Willie. Charlie. He's right. He was in Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. He was Charlie. But he played Charlie Bucket. And now he's a veterinarian. Yes. But, like, we're not talking small animals. We're, like, farm animals. Big, big, big animals. 
Cowls. Big animals. Big animals. November 2nd, Marie Antoinette. Oh, don't lose your head. Yeah, her antics and extravagance is kind of what incited the French Revolution. Uh, to, unfortunately, mm-hmm. Ray Walston, who is uh, quite the actor. Yes, but what, and of course, everybody, well, I, th- I think a lot of people might remember him, you know, our generation and older. They might remember him as Uncle Martin or from uh, My Favorite Martian. Yep. But. For me, you know, and then maybe beyond that, um, you know, maybe people think of him uh, from Damn Yankees. Yep. He was but the devil. The devil. But the devil. I, to me, my favorite role that he played, and he, he got to reprise his role a couple of times, and that was Boothby mm. in, the, in Star Trek. Yes. Uh, once in Next Generation, and then twice... Of all places, in Star Trek Voyager, which is like a very odd place to put him. Yeah, interesting. Uh, where are we? Uh, oh, Amar Bose. Amar Bose of the Bose Electronics. We wouldn't have the wonderful Bose Electronics and those uh, awesome Bose speakers, which yes. we, which we don't have. Yes, I wish we did. We have Roland speakers mm. uh, and uh, Yamahas, right? <laughs> uh, Sydney Loft. Ah, one Mr. Time husband of Judy Garland. Right. Mr. Judy Garland, yes, and father of two of their children, Joey and Lorna. And George Bull. Is he a, or isn't he, a logician? Ha. Ah, ha. that's ha. so Boolean. The Boolean, yes. The Boolean logic. Steve Ditko. Oh, okay. comic, book, comic book artist legend. Absolutely. Spider Man and Doctor Strange were two of his. Huge character. He worked very closely with, with Stanley. With Stanley, yeah. yeah. Yep. And Keith Emerson. Amazing keyboardist in his day. And friend of ours, Jeremy Reisenhoover and Brian Augustine. Happy birthday, Happy birthday, Brian. November 3rd, Dolph Lundgren, He Man, mm. and Vincenzo Bellini. He was uh, an opera composer. I didn't put on here Charles Bronson. Sorry. Jo- Charles Ooh, Bronson. Of <laughs> Death Wish. Yes. Charles Dennis Buczynski is his real name. Yes, but and how he got that last name is the he, trick. He showed up, and he was trying to get a job as an actor, and one of the people at... at uh, the is Param- Paramount. At Paramount Studios said, you have got to change choose a different name. And the entry and where people went to sign up to be an actor was at the Bronson, at the Bronson Gate. Gate. And so he chose Bronson. Yeah, that's when you that's could drive through time. the front Bronson Gate, which exactly. they don't anymore. And also, last on the list, Facebook friend and our realtor, Jan Dahl. Who was who instrumental. In, she yes. And we would not have this recording studio had it not been for her. Exactly. And happy birthday to everybody. That's it for the birthdays this time. Hi, this is Barbara Dillon, one of the co-hosts of Fanbase Press's flagship podcast, The Fanbase Weekly. During the Fanbase Weekly podcast, the co-hosts and I discuss the top geek news stories of the week. In each episode, we are joined by special guests from all across the pop culture spectrum to get their take on what's happening in geekdom. Past guests have included Jeffrey Thorne, writer of Leverage and the Librarians, DC All Access's Jason Inman, Debbie Lynn Smith of Chimera Press, Xena Warrior Princess executive producer Stephen L. Sears, Ashley V. Robinson of Geek History Lessons, and many, many more. Join us for an episode of the podcast that celebrates fandoms on a weekly basis. A new episode of the Fanbase Weekly is released every Monday. Be sure to subscribe to us on iTunes or look for the podcast at fanbasepress.com. Go give a listen to our friends Barbara and Bryant Dillon over at Fanbase Weekly. You can find them at fanbasepress.com. And now, what time is it? What time is it? Huh? Uh, it's a little after four. Uh, silly. <laughs> ah. it, it's time for this PSA. I'm Daniel Ratcliffe, and I believe that reaching out for help is the bravest thing a person can do. 
If you are struggling and need support, call the Trevor Lifeline at 1-866-488-7386. It's free and confidential and trained counsellors are there to listen 24-7 without judgment. To learn more about the Trevor Project's life-saving work for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender or questioning young people, go to thetrevorproject.org. It's time for the feedback. I may as well let it finish. It only has five seconds left. Far out. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have time. So we have some feedback here. And interestingly enough, uh, we had the promo from Barbara Dillon because huh. this first bit of feedback is from Fanbase Press. And this is in regards to a press release that we ran. Fanbase Press announces Kinsey, the definitive bilingual edition, and nuclear power in celebration of its 10th anniversary. Nuclear vessels. Nuclear. Uh, <laughs> Nuclear powder. I don't know. <laughs> How many yeah. ways can I really ruin this? Uh, celebrates his 10th anniversary. Anniversary. Anniversary, <laughs> yes. Uh, but first, yes, we got a comment from Fanbase Press. They said, Heartfelt thanks to the wonderful team at TG Geeks, TG Squared Studios, for their support of Fanbase Press's upcoming 10th anniversary releases, King State the Definitive Bilingual, Bilingual Edition, and Nuclear Power. Yeah, they, and, they announced that at uh, LA Comic Con. Right. So. And then we got a comment from Kinsey. Uh, they say, the hardcover is full of amazing bonus features and is now available for pre-order. Yay. So, hey, people, you might want to check that out. And then we got a comment from Nuclear Power. Imagine that. Wow. And they say, another big thank you to the team at TG, TG Geeks, TG Squared Studios, for sharing the news that Fanbase Press will release the creator-owned comic book series, Nuclear Power, next year as part of their 10th anniversary celebration. Coming to Comixology in October 2020, the trade paperback is now available for pre-order. Woohoo! Yay. And then lastly, this is in regards to Ben's Breakdown, Apocalypse Later International Fantastic Film Festival Review. We got a comment from Rick Olson. He is part of the studio Edge of Orion, and they're the ones who did the Star Wars short, No Easy Target. If you have an opportunity to see this... Oh, it's fabulous you should watch it absolutely it's it's wonderful it is incredible it's 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 inspiring and it has an amazing message it certainly does and uh and rick writes some really nice words about no easy target coming from a viewer <laughs> i'm a viewer at the apocalypse later international film festival and yeah. that's our feedback i thought we got several comments uh on the film festival next time next time okay well next time you can leave a comment on anything that we publish, whether it is an episode or whether it's an article. And you can do that by leaving comments at tggeeks.com on the article or episode. You can find us on Facebook and the Facebook page. We publish everything there, so you can comment there as well if that's easier for you. You can also comment on our YouTube episodes or on Twitter and Instagram. Everything goes to Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Our episodes only are on YouTube. We want to hear from you because you are important to us. Let us know what you think about all of our articles and all the content that we publish. If you want to, you can leave a voicemail for us, and we will play that on air, and you can be famous too. Call 469-TG-GEEKS. That is 469-844-3357. And when you do leave feedback, Please, Please always play, play nice. nice. Sorry. <laughs> you messed me up. I did. I apologize. <laughs> well, right now we're going to do a little shout out to our friend, Iman Saman. At, uh, he has a new YouTube channel called Arab and Dictionary, and we're going to play a little spot for him. Welcome to Arab and Dictionary. Today's word is Habibi. Ha-bibi. One of the most versatile Arabic words. 
The literal meaning of Habibi is my lover or my love. In colloquial Arabic, it's used to mean baby, darling, buddy, friend, dude, sweetie, yo, bro, and many others depending on the context. Do I look fat in these jeans, Habibi? Um, uh, <clears throat> yes, Habibi. Uh, you know, uh, uh, let me put my glasses on, Habibi. Hey, remember to like, subscribe, and share. Tell us in the comments if there are words you'd like us to feature next. Today's Arabian Dictionary Word is available on t-shirts, mugs, and other cool products that you can buy for yourself or your loved ones. Click the link in our bio or in the description below. Go give a listen to our friend Ayman Saman at his YouTube channel, uh, Arabian Dictionary. I was trying to read something that's that I've stricken out on the on this. Normally, his uh, newer episodes have his little voiceover about him being an Amer- Arab American voiceover <laughs> artist. Yeah, and he wanted to connect with his culture of birth and culture of choice, and it's his attempt at making the Arabic language accessible to English speaking audiences in a fun and jovial way. A foreigner is no longer foreign once you understand their language. Thanks to Iman. We want to talk about the Red Dress Ball. The Grand Canyon Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence are holding their third annual Red Dress Ball on November 16th at the Parsons Center for Health and Wellness. Proceeds go to the Joshua Tree Feeding Program and AIDS Walk Arizona, sponsored by Aunt Rita's Foundation. There's going to be a silent auction, a no-host bar, as well as dancing and all kinds of crazy things going on tickets are twenty dollars you can go to azsisters.org if you are in transition or have already transitioned and are in crisis or you know of someone in crisis there is a special hotline just for you the hotline is provided by translifeline.org and staffed by specially trained counselors who are transgender themselves The hotline in the U.S. is 877-565-8860. In Canada, it is 877-330-6366. Or you can go to the translifeline.org for more information about the important work they are doing. Please reach out for help. Yeah, baby! They're like two gay geeks. They're together, you know. They're two gay guys and they're geeks. Is that okay? Well, well, <laughs> we <laughs> we saw the most bizarre movie the other night. Yeah, we. It's been out for oh gosh, I I think it was. Well, it was the last movie it, 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 for a while because it was the last film that Heath Ledger made. Yeah, I think it was released in well ten years ago. I think, as a matter of fact, and we thought we'd give it a shot. We had nothing else to watch, so we thought we'd take a look at it. It's the Imaginarium of Doctor Parnassus. Yeah, two thousand nine, ten years ago. And so, um, uh, all I gotta say oh is <laughs> um, Terry Gilliam. Uh, yes. That pretty much sums it up. Terry okay, Gilliam. Okay, moving on. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Terry Gilliam. I mean, this this was wow. such... I mean, visually, it's amazing. It the Visually, the, the cinematography is stunning, and the costumes are stunning. The performances from all of the are quite actors good. are quite good. And But the story is just whacked out, wackadoodle craziness. It's um, like a drug trip. <laughs> Almost, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's it's very hard to follow. I mean, I was able to get a sense of where the beginning and the end was, but there's this. Well, obviously, <sighs> because the the beginning was when the opening credits started, and then the ending was where the closing credits were. Right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, I I appreciate that illumination. It's, it's amazing why I never the illumination that of Doctor Parnassus. <laughs> It might have improved it. No, I don't want to say that it improved it. It might have made it clearer. <laughs> but um, it was definitely imaginative. Well, that's it yeah. was. 
it was it was interesting uh, to say the least. I some of the themes and uh, you know I, I I sort of understood it, but it was a way roundabout way of. Uh, Telling those <laughs> stories. Yeah. Well, th- the thing that Terry Gilliam is really big on, he likes to tell vignettes. Yeah. Uh, I noticed that when he did Time Bandits. Every time they went back in time, it was a new story. You know, wherever they went. Same thing with, um, uh, I think it's called uh, The Misadventures of Baron Munchausen. Yeah. Same kind of thing there. I mean, because there's a lot of flashback and a lot of storytelling that's being told in that. And we were getting some of that, too. There's uh, Every time they would step through the mirror, there would be this new, new escapade, world. this yeah. new thing going on that just, well, uh, and it helped, it was supposed to help reveal more of the characters. But that was more like a vignette in a vignette, because each time they they stopped one place, that was one vignette, and then somebody stepped through the mirror, which was a vignette within the vignette. Mm. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. So, so um, the, the movie's one gigantic, you know, Russian nesting doll. Yeah. A, a nesting. A nesting. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> I, I, I kind of know. Maybe some autons might help this film. You never know. Uh, but but it, it, it's, I mean, if you, it was good. I'm, I'm not going to say that I didn't like it. I was intrigued by it. I was fascinated by it. It was just But it is such an odd film. It was just unusual, yes. Extremely odd. But again, great performances. There's more going on you know, more more in favor with the film, more positive things happening about the movie than there are negative that I would say if you've got nothing else to going you've got nothing else going on, give this one a shot. It's available on Netflix. Yep. That's how we found it. Give it a shot. Um, if Let you, us know what you think. Yeah, I'd be fascinated, to, or if you have seen it, what did yeah. you think about it? I it was a fascinating movie, uh, but not one that's you know you just it's not a popcorn flick, yep. not by any stretch of the imagination. Nope, you'll you'll be munching on that popcorn. Yeah, <laughs> and one last thing that I want to say, um, as we were watching the movie last night, and I'm just going to throw this out there as an announcement: Apple TV. They're the new streaming service. They're going to be making the Isaac Asimov Foundation series. Mm. Oh, my God. That could be interesting. Maybe I can watch that and, and not freak out. Well, if we can, maybe if we can watch that, then maybe we can actually read the book and it'll make sense. Yeah, there we, you go. Which, of course, would make us heretics, but oh, well. Well, of course. I just haven't been able to make it through it. I, I can't either. Oh, well. Anyway... As everybody knows, we are huge supporters of independent creators, whether filmmakers, comic book artists, writers, or others. Please, if you see independent creators, please buy their stuff. Please talk to people about their stuff. Tell other people, you know, just be, talk to them. Ask them about Be supportive. Their stuff. Be supportive of them. If you go and find them at a con or a book fair or something like that, please have cash for them. They don't need the credit card fees. Please consider supporting Independent Creators. The Joshua Tree Feeding Program is a 501c3 non-profit food pantry for the HIV AIDS community of Maricopa and Pinal Counties. JTFP offers a place where you can they can select from a wide variety of nutritional foods for the clients to take home. It's set up as a store so the clients can pick and choose what they prefer so it empowers them to not waste any food instead of like some feeding programs that here's here's your box yeah whatever's in there but they get to choose what they want and they really do set it up as a store there's a lot of things to choose from a lot uh, it's it's amazing you should make an appointment to visit uh, Joshua Tree on one of their uh Wednesday uh, distribution days and see how it's set up or uh Joseph posts uh a picture every Wednesday Mm -hmm. of what they've set up, and you can see how they kind of set it up. In 2010, they started their pet assistance program so that uh, clients can get free dog or cat food for the fur babies, as well as information on resources for low-cost neutering as well as vet care. They're an all-volunteer organization, and please consider supporting Joshua Tree either with a single gift or a monthly recurring gift. 
you can go to jtfp.org. And here's our weekly recap. Starting with Sunday, October 20th, Dr. Zombie Monster Family Physician number 71. And then on Monday, October 21st, TG Geeks episode number 244. We are closing in on 250. Yep. Wow. And then on we'll Tuesday. Special oh, Tuesday. yes, we will. And then on Tuesday, October 22nd, Keats Corner. He's got a book review for I wrote something. For the Shoreless Sea. He heard him you heard him talk a little bit about that last week, but now you actually get to read the review and then really learn what he thought about it. Yep. And then on Wednesday, the 23rd, a press release, Sesame Street, 50-year anniversary celebration on HBO, November 9th. Also, Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker. This is a news news item that has both the trailer, the latest trailer, as well as a featurette. Then, on Thursday the 24th, Deku Original Series The Third releases October 24th. On Friday the 25th, New Sushi Number 85, Morsels of News from Japan and Beyond. Wow. That is closing from in. Closing wow, in on 100. 100. Wow, Hamish, you are amazing. And then, lastly, to close it all out, on Saturday the 26th, Dr. Zombie Monster Family no. Physician Number 72. No, that that's, would be Sunday. Saturday, oh, you're right. Saturday is your... Oh, you're doing? correct. That That's right. I'm sorry. I jumped ahead. I will be having a review of the latest Donald Strachey film. And I can't remember the name of it. I, I thought you were doing the Out of Body. Um, no, I already, already did Out of Body. Did you? Yes. Oh, okay. You know, it's the new Donald Strachey oh, film. Oh, that's right. That's right. I'm sorry. Forgive me. You can find all these things at tggeeks.com. What do I know? As well as entries on our Facebook page. Please visit and comment. It's only our website. Have to give a couple of shout outs. First, to the Argo Times Post Dispatch News for republishing our content from time to time. And that is put out by Brian Weber. He is a human Arkle, but on f- Twitter, yes, Twitter, he is known as the Human Arkle and Dale versus Evil, but that's for Halloween. But you can find him and the Post-Dispatch News by going to Twitter and searching Arkel, at A-R-K-L-E. And he has the shameless cash grab. He's got season three, and you can find it by going to YouTube.com slash Arkel Studios. That's all one word. The last of the regular episodes for season three, number 19, is up. And there is to be a wrap-up scheduled for Halloween. And we must give some shout-outs to some Facebook groups for allowing us to post episodes, articles, and other fun stuff on their pages. First, to Gay Geeks After Hours. You can find them by going to facebook.com slash group slash Gay Geeks After Hours. We appreciate the fact that they let us share away there. And then lastly, to The Gay Geek for also allowing us to share our lovely stuff on their page. And their URL is facebook.com slash groups slash The Gay Geek. And we must give thanks to their moderator, Jeremiah Rees, for giving us his blessing to share our stuff there. Yes, thank you, Jeremiah. And lastly, we're found on Spotify, TuneIn, Stitcher, as well as where other fine podcasts can be found. Also, check us out on Krypton Radio at 3 a.m., 3 p.m. Pacific Time on Tuesdays, and listen to their other content. They are a 24-hour geeky internet radio station. Please write us and review us on iTunes, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Okay, that should do it for this episode of TG Geeks Webcast. Be sure to check out the article for this webcast episode. We're going to have several links of things we talked about in this episode. And remember, you can comment on our Facebook page or our website, tggeeks.com. Or you can leave us a voicemail at 469-TG-Geeks. That is 469-844-3357 from TG Squared Studios. I'm Keith Lane. Thanks for listening. Please be kind to yourself and others. Peace. Cheers. Cheers.